Steve, thank you. A potential toxic algae crisis looms on our summer horizon. A big upcoming rainy season and storm season could compel the Army Corps of Engineers to dump algae-laden lake water into the St. Lucie estuary. I focus today on the north end of Lake Okeechobee and the huge watershed that sits atop it. Fertilizer from dairy, ranching, and citrus interests there is carried by runoff north to south into the lake. And the phosphorus content is a nutrient that acts as a superfood for algae blooms. Slowing that flow is vital to water quality. Native Indians named it Okeechobee, meaning big water. But one third of the big lake is actually wetlands where residents swim, fly, and slosh across its teeming marshes. It's just full of snakes and frogs and turtles and strange salamanders. Florida Audubon Society scientist Dr. Paul Gray has cataloged all of it. Ooh, some pondweed. For more than a quarter century, by foot and by airboat. Is this what we wish all of the lake looked like? Yeah, you see this eelgrass here? Um, that's a submerged aquatic plant. And the open water of the lake is, is just past that, that vegetation line, that green line. This is our remaining water supply, and it needs to be clean enough to drink. Um, and it can support wildlife and a great bass fishery and tourism. This ecosystem faces growing threats that come into view near open water. See the algae swirling in there, the little pieces of it? So that's the cyanobacteria. Fertilizer runoff from north of the lake and human waste legally dumped there by our East Coast cities feed this brew. It fertilized them and now that they have that extra nutrient, they take over. An ugly toxic green tide already making its presence known this year. We're gonna have to uh, clean up the nutrients north of the lake. We're gonna have to catch more water. Scientists think the lake can absorb and handle about 100 tons of phosphorus runoff each year. Instead of getting 100 ton years, we're averaging about 500. Uh, the year of Hurricane Irma, we got a thousand, and we think that's why the next year we had that super bloom in the lake. Big rains early last fall swelled the lake yet again. Right now we're working on reservoirs east, west, and south. Um, when we get done with those, we got to work on more storage north. Too much water also drowns these vital marsh grasses. More reservoirs to better regulate water levels could protect these wildlife nurseries and natural sponges. You know, if it was five feet deep, we'd be able to see the bottom. I mean, it's just, it's that clear. And, um, and it's because of all this, you know, all these little scuzzy things. This is, this is life. And this is the plants taking up nutrients in a constructive way and feeding a food chain. Solutions are out there. And Paul Gray is not giving up. I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Missouri. And, um, and my family's like, you're coming back here? And I'm like, oh, I don't think so. Because <laughs> this is just a paradise. It's, it's subtropical. It's got all this cool stuff. And and, you know, it's, it's worth fighting for. So, anyway. A big fight indeed. Fishermen note the marshlands of the lake provide rich fishing grounds and that the algae blooms on open water, while an ominous trend are not the total picture for the giant lake. And Dr. Gray notes there are many ranches and farms north of the lake that are working on water storage-related projects, though more is needed in terms of public-private efforts. We'll be looking at one of those projects soon.